Hi, I'm Milton Hom. I'm an optometrist from Azusa, California. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about Demodex, and I'm going to kind of share with you my personal experiences with the mite called Demodex. You know, in the past, I've always looked at it as a very, very rare condition. So because it's a very, very rare condition, I really didn't concern myself with the mite at all. But, you know, it was kind of like, I don't know, a diagnosis... Um, that was more like a last resort diagnosis. In other words, a ocular surface patient would be coming in, you would see them for one visit, two visits, three visits. You keep on trying all these different treatments and none of the treatments would work. So finally, you would say to yourself, well maybe, just maybe, it might be Demodex. It was kind of like a Hail Mary type of diagnosis. Well, you know, I was pretty happy in my own little world not knowing about Demodex, but up until about a year ago I had a conversation with Scott Schachter at Pismo Beach. And If you know Scott, he always likes to talk about Demodex. When we were talking I asked him the question, how often do you see the Demodex might? And the reason why I asked that was because in my mind I thought it was a very, very rare condition. Well, Scott replied that he saw at least one to two patients a day that had Demodex. And I was just totally shocked when he told me this. I went ahead, I took a look at what the literature had to say, and they had numbers like 100% prevalence of patients that was age 70 and older. When I saw something like this, I it just blew my mind because how could you have a prevalence of 100% but yet, in my clinical practice, I saw 0%. Now for you, my colleagues, do you have Demodex in your practice? A lot of my colleagues say, no, they don't see it at all. Well, if you have rosacea, then I will guarantee that you have Demodex in your practice. And the reason why I say this is because if you take a look at what the, what the meta-analysis says, all across the board, of all the studies that they took a look at, they found that there was a direct link between Demodex and rosacea. So if you have rosacea, I will guarantee that you have Demodex. Another common condition that we see is blepharitis. It's very, very common. Now I used to think that, let's say, this was the amount of blepharitis I would see, and this would be the amount of Demodex that was in blepharitis or that had blepharitis. Well then again I took a look at the studies 63%, 88%, 97% of the patients that have blepharitis also have Demodex. I mean these numbers are just off the charts. So if you have blepharitis in your practice you also have Demodex. So how is it that you take a look? How do you detect the mite? Well, um, <clears throat> Scott got me to buy a microscope, an LED microscope. I started epilating the patients and I put them on the microscope slide, put a cover slip on there and look at the microscope to actually see and count the mites. And you want to know something is that uh, over time I started seeing more and more and more of these mites as I started to get better at epilating and picking out which lashes to go ahead and to look at it under the microscope. I like to pick out what's called the what I like to call the juicy lashes. In other words, the lashes that have a lot of cylindrical dandruff, the lashes that have a lot of distension around the base, um, a lot of lid erythemia, and also really, really greasy and oily lashes because you know the mite actually likes oil. That's what it feeds on. So, you know, why is it that these particular lashes have a lot of mites? Well, cylindrical dandruff is essentially just a lot of waste products. It's a lot of waste products. It's a lot of Demodex dead bodies. And that's what it is. It's just leaking out of the lash. Now, when we take a look at blepharitis, cylindrical dandruff is actually located at the base of the lash uh, where it meets the lid. If you see debris, that's, let's say, uh, at the end of the lash, that is not cylindrical dandruff. It has to be at the base. And it's at the base because that is all the stuff that's leaking out 
of all of the stuff that the mites produce. Now, what are some of the other things? Well, some of the other things is, is that the, 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 it looks distended. And the reason why it looks distended is because you got a lot of these dead bodies and a lot of waste products. Did you know that the mites have no anus? What happens is, is when they die, they explode. And that's the reason why you have a lot of pressure built up with these distended um, lids and distended lashes. Other things that I like to look at is also the health of the lash. If the lash looks sick, in other words, discolored or short or misdirected, then that tells me that you know the lash is unhealthy and there's probably a mite that's biting down on it. <clears throat> you know, I've had patients before that I would ask, you know, do your lashes fall out quite a bit? And what they would do is that they would actually pull the lashes off of their eyelids, hand them to me. I would put them on a slide, and there and behold, I would see all kinds of mites on those lashes. Um, what are some of the ways that we look at to go ahead and treat these types of patients? Well, really what it comes down to is that um, tea tree oil is really, um, by Sheffer saying he's done studies showing that it's highly, highly effective against the mite. What it does is that it's toxic, and it actually kills off the mite. Um, if you take a look at the studies, uh, other things that you can use is caraway oil. But the thing is, the difference between caraway oil and also tea tree oil is that caraway oil is a lot more expensive than tea tree oil. Now, what are some of these applications? I mean, how are they available? Well, some of my colleagues, what they're doing is that they're mixing Australian tea tree oil that they get from Amazon with macadamia nut oil, 50-50 mix, and kind of like make their own tea tree oil treatments. I really didn't have a lot of uptake with in-office treatments. But then I took the microscope, I moved it into my exam room, I started pulling the lashes, and in front of the patient, I would show them what it looks like and what the mite looks like. You get responses like, ah! And those were just my responses alone. What happens is, is that when the patient actually sees something like that, they're much more likely to say, I want to have that treatment, whatever the cost. Um, other things is, is that uh, we like to um, think about, and I explained to the patients that you're not going to be able to get rid of all the mites. In fact, the mites are almost like bacteria. Um, there are some theories is, is that they're part of our normal flora. flora. Um, 1,000 to 2,000 are the average mites that we have. And the mites, you know, it's not only your lashes, it's anywhere that you have hair. You can have in, in your head, you can have in your eyebrows. Uh, yeah, you could have it down there. I mean, studies show that anytime you have hair follicles, that is where the mites can reside. So we also uh, prescribe tea trio treatments to the patient to use, you know, on their hair and other parts of their body. Um, <clears throat> what also is interesting is, is that um, with the treatments, uh, patients expect that to be a cure. And I tell the patient straight out, this is not going to be a cure. All we're going to do is knock the number of night, knock the number of mites down. Because what you have is an infestation. You have too many mites causing all these problems, and what we do is that we just knock it down. We recommend two treatments spaced two weeks apart, but you may need treatments, subsequent treatments later on because the mites could you know, get out of control again. Uh, what we also like to recommend is using the lids, lid wipes, uh, uh, not OcuSoft, but Claridex from BioTissue has lid wipes that have actually tea tree oil in them. And uh, what I like to do is I tell the patients to use that in between the treatments and also afterwards. We sell them out of our practice. Now, uh, Mario, has a, Mario Gutierrez has a really neat uh, thing. I, I kind of call it his sw squish and fan technique. And what he does is that sometimes when you have the package of the Claridex, um, the wipe, uh, some of the goop just stays on one side. So what he does is that he tells the patient to squish the package up so you can spread out the tea tree oil open it up, apply it to your lids, and then take out a fan and fan yourself for about one minute because many, many cases, these tea tree oil wipes, even though they're dilute and even though they're more comfortable, they will still give burning sensation to many, many patients. So these are some of the things that I've used in my practice to go ahead and diagnose Demodex and also to treat Demodex. And my hopes is, is that it will go ahead and help you in your practice. Happy hunting.